I'm going to take a little time today to talk about Ham Radio Deluxe and what we're doing. I call it Features and Futures. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've done and what we plan on doing. Um, and so if you have any questions, I'm going to have time at the end for questions. But if I say something that you have questions about, feel free to raise your hand. I think we've got plenty of time. If we're in here for an hour, <coughs> see, i got a fan, and my granddaughter in the front's already clapping, so that's good. Um, if you can't hear me in the back, just tell me, and I'll speak up. Like I said, I, I have no problem filling a room for the most part. So um, I'm Mike Harper. I'm one of... Uh, one of the partners that owns HRD software, we make Ham Radio Deluxe. Um, just to talk a little bit in history, I was the instigator in 2011 to acquire the original uh, source code and, and rights to Ham Radio Deluxe past, present, and future from Simon Brown. And then I kind of backed out of it for a while and uh, let someone else run it. And uh, we can talk about that if you want to. I prefer not to because we've done a lot of things over the course of the last 18 months that I think are worth worth noting and worth, worth talking about. So I'm going to talk a little bit about an overview. I'll do some a uh, little bit of review uh, for 2017, talk about what we accomplished during 2017, <clears throat> because that kind of flows into what our plans are for the future. Um, we'll talk about you know, when folks are become Ham Radio Deluxe customers, um, they're not only getting the software, but they're getting support. I want to explain how that works in case you ever need to use it, and plenty of people do. And then um, I'm going to talk about the, the, the future of Ham Radio Deluxe and where we want to take it. So how many people, by a show of hands, have used Ham Radio Deluxe or tried it? Okay, good. So I'm at, I'm at 80%, okay. Um, and so most of this is, is review. I was in, uh, uh, or so, some of these next few slides will be reviewed for you. Uh, I was in CPAC last week, uh, Oregon, uh, doing that presentation, and only 20% maybe had used it in the past. So something's going on on the West Coast. I don't know what it is, but we need to do more shows out there apparently. But this is the rig control screen. This is what kind of, if people went online right now and did a, did a search for HRD software or Ham Radio Deluxe, they'd probably see this pop up in the images. Um, it's probably the most recognizable screen. It represents about 20% of the functionality of the software. The logbook, in my point of view, is kind of the heart of it all because whether or not you're using uh, digital modes or our digital mode software or whether you're using WSJT, JT Alert, other N1MM or other things, they all integrate back to the logbook and this is how uh, you can manage your awards, upload, download to various different services like Club Log or Logbook of the World and so on. And then this is the digital modes application. Again, for most of you, you know this, but this is how you uh, encode and decode uh, digital, uh, audio signals or analog signals, encode them to digital, put them out over your RF spectrum, and then on the other end, decode them and display them on the screen. This is our uh, rig control, or I'm sorry, the rotor control application. And uh, we support every popular rotor uh, out there and then um, the satellite tracking application. And here in a moment, if we need to, I can uh, either go into some demonstration of things if you want to see them, or we can do it back at the booth, uh, depending on how we're doing on time. So in review, um, I mentioned a little bit about the changes in the company. Um, so we made management changes um, at the end of 2016. So we had three partners through the end of 2016. At the beginning of 2017, uh, one of the partners left the company, and Randy and I began running the company at that point. Um, if you want to think of it this way, Randy and I kind of acted as advisors uh, up to that point, um, with limited, uh, really limited control over over the company. But we, and primarily because we both have day jobs, and I still have a day job, and so does Randy. So. Uh, but Randy's the president of TimeWave, so if you know the PK232 or the Navigator, Randy's the other partner that's remaining with me now. And, and even though we still have day jobs, we're doing we're doing this as a, a, a kind of our part-time job. Um, my wife, if you're at the booth, you'll notice my wife's in the booth all the time now. She's running sales and marketing, generally speaking, today. Uh, my, my oldest daughter's helping us out as well with certain kinds of um, marketing activities, and which is why I'm on the camera now. So. 
Um, but we cha we changed everything, uh, everything about the way the business run. And the reason why we did this was because I wanted to change the culture of the company to where we were putting customers first every single time. That there would be no possibility in the future that we would ever mistreat a customer. That was my primary goal. I didn't like the way our customers were being treated. They complained to me and eventually uh, we made the changes necessary to, to improve that. And um, since 1-1 of 17, we've had nothing but compliments. And we're going to continue that. Um, we just recently started Google Reviews and everybody's posted a five-star review. All the Eham reviews have been positive. We had one guy that was on there and had complained about something that happened, but by the time we contacted him, it had already been resolved. I think he's revised the, the review and it was just uh, a t timing of when something had happened in the past. So I think we have a pretty good track record of how we're working with our customers now. Um, the manual was kind of outdated, so our user guide was outdated, and we've taken that manual and I've converted it to uh, an online wiki. Now for those of you who like to, to print it out, I still convert that to a PDF and you can download it and print it, but we're making updates to it all the time in the, in the wiki, so you can go to the wiki and I can probably show you that here in a few minutes if you want to see that as well. Um, last year was a really productive year for development. We did about nine changes last year, um, sorry, nine releases, and about 150 changes last year. Um, we brought on some great new developers and uh, they've done a fantastic job. The main developer we have at the moment is a former Microsoft employee. He worked on the uh, Microsoft Visual Studio product team um, and he's written books and, uh, on C++ and MFC so he's an expert. And uh, so he's done a fantastic job. We've got a few other people. I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a moment. I have a question about that. Nine releases in one year. Mm -hmm. uh, how many this year? How many this year? Uh, uh, talk about that later, but I'll answer your question now. Okay, yeah. but the point being, nine releases in one year for the customers, how in the world can they absorb that much change mm -hmm. in one year? Okay, that's a good point. Let me repeat the question for folks that might not have heard in the past. The question was, they said nine, re nine releases a year seems like a lot of change for customers to absorb. Um, and you know, let me, let me talk a little bit about why we're doing nine, nine release. Well, if, if you'll bear with me, I want to get to that question sure. here in a few sure. slides. Because I think I can give you a, a better visual description of why that is. Got it. Um, we have our release notes online now. So my, my, my point of view is I'm completely transparent. If I could build a house without, with, with, that was completely made of windows, I would probably do that because I, I don't have any expectation of privacy, for one thing. But the other piece of it is, is that I don't hide anything. I put everything out there for folks to see, and you can see our release notes. And if you go into our release notes that are published online, you can get there from um, our, our main webpage or you can go to releasenotes.hamradiodeluxe.com. You can see all the changes that have been made uh, throughout the course of time, all the way back to 2011. You can go in and you can see uh, all the comments that were made about the changes between the developers and the support folks and information that was gathered by the customer. And so, um, you know, when I did that, some of my staff said, I can't believe you're sharing all that stuff for our customer. But, I, but we work for them. You know, I want them to know what's, I'm not hiding anything from anyone, I want people to know what's going on. So uh, the release notes are completely out there. Um, you can see everything that's been requested, everything that's been completed, and I can show you a little bit about that in a moment. Um, we started off 2017 from a, from a sales point of view, and believe me, there's not a lot of money to be made in this, and I'll get to that in a moment. But um, we started out, you know, digging a hole for ourselves. Um, the end of 2016 wasn't a great time for us. And so as we went into the beginning of 2017, we had to dig ourselves out of a hole from a customer relationship point of view, frankly. And so, uh, you know, once we got to, to the end of the third, fourth quarter of last year, things started to pick up and we ended up um, uh, exceeding what I thought we could do last year. And we, we actually ended the year slightly better than the, um, 2016. And this year's starting off even better. So. What that really means is that now we've got uh, more capital that we can put into development. We can do more interesting things, and I'll get to that in a moment. 
Um, you know, Keen, I, I talked about me and Randy. Uh, how many folks have called our support folks? Okay, about 10%. Um, Kevin, uh, Tim, and Ferry are the people that you would be working with. Uh, Tim right now is controlling one of the demo stations in, um, in, our, uh, in our booth. Um, just like he would do if you called in and said, I'm having trouble with something or can you show me how to do something? He would take control over your computer, you would watch him do all the work, just like he's doing with the station over here. Um, get a lot of compliments. I, I, take, uh, I take all these folks to Dayton every year and everybody wants to come in and meet these guys because they work with them you know, as often as they want. Sometimes they just call and share ideas and that's fine too. Um, my wife Tammy, who's in the booth now, uh, Peggy and Veronica, who's left recently. I should revise it, but uh, they're the folks supporting people when they want to buy the product or if they call and say, you know, I can't, I can't find my key, my activation key, where do I get my, can you send it to me? And we look up activation keys. Uh, one gentleman today uh, hadn't renewed since 2014. We looked up his key, gave him his key. He didn't give us any money. We thanked him and have a nice day. Uh, the software's his, he can still run it, so that's how it works. Um, we actually have five developers um, in the product right now. Um, they're all freelance developers. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we sell and, and how we support it um, because it's important. I, I recognize that a hundred bucks or fifty bucks if you buy a renewal is a not, not a trivial thing. Um, it's not a trivial thing for me and I know it's not trivial for you. So I want to know, I want you to know what you're buying. Um, and first of all, let me talk about the, the initial software activation key. This is your license to use uh, Ham Radio Deluxe. When you buy that, you own that, that, that ability to run that software forever. We don't sell subscriptions. It's unfortunate that somebody put in our software the word subscription because there's nothing subscription about what we do. It's like if you, in 2003, if you bought Windows XP, you would have gotten a CD, right? you would have gotten an activation key, right? And if you still had the CD and the activation key today, and you had a burning urge to install Windows XP <laughs> on, a, on a computer somewhere, it would still work, true? Absolutely, you could do that. That's the same way our software is. If you buy an activation key, you've got the software, you can run it forever. My job is to try to find compelling reasons and, and compelling feature additions that would cause you to say, oh, I'd like to use those new features. I want to be able to upload the club, club log. I want to be able to integrate to WSJTX and JTLR and it, it, introduce features to you that are important uh, in your ham radio life. So um, that's why uh, the other piece of it is available, which is the renewal for software maintenance and support. So when you buy it for the first time, you get the software activation key, you get 12 months of software maintenance and support. That means if during 12 months, if you have any problems, you contact us, you're talking to Tim, you're talking to Ferry, you're talking to Kevin, they're helping you fix these things. After a year, if the software does everything you need it to do and you're perfectly happy with it, no technical problems, everything's cool, continue using it. There's no need for you to pay us again. That's not the way it's designed. If after that 12 months, if it's a year later, two years later, five years later, it doesn't matter, if you saw some features and you want to use the software, you want the upgraded features, then you buy the renewal of software maintenance and support. You don't pay the full price ever again. So you pay 50% uh, of retail, and that's $49.95 to renew it, and you get all the features that have been released from that point up to, up to that point, uh, from the be beginning up to that point. Um, so that it's, it's important for me that you, that you understand that we don't sell subscriptions, and it's important for me to know that you guys are, are aware that you can contact our support. If you paid for it, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's what you bought. You've got it coming to you. You should, you should feel that you can use it. I've got, I was talking to someone recently, and they said, uh, well, you know, I bought your software, and uh, I was having trouble figuring out how to connect it to my FT991, so I contacted a buddy of mine, because he knows about computers, and he came down to my house, and he couldn't figure out how to do it either. Well, <laughs> call us, because we're the experts. We do this every single day. Um, 
we, we work with people on connecting every radio known to man uh, to this software and, and helping to get this working. So please do that. Any, I want to make sure that all this is clear. Everybody have questions about the, the software licensing and all? Good? Yeah. The other thing that's worth pointing out to you, by the way, because um, my wife's a ham and all three of my kids are hams. They don't all live in the same house anymore, thank goodness, but, um, well, my oldest daughter does, but um, anyway, if you have family members who are hams, you can contact us and we'll give them a key for free. We just go on QR set and make sure that you're related, and last names look the same, or they're at the same address, and then we'll give out um, an additional key for a family member at no additional charge. Okay. And they can also install that on as many computers as they own as well. Um, so the support options, once you've got support, uh, you can contact us directly. Uh, there are three different ways you can, you can access us. You can go online to our support site, which is support.hamradiodeluxe.com, and you can, you can enter in a ticket if you want, want to call it that, but you enter in the information you know, your, your call sign, your name, your phone number, because we want to be your email address, we want to be able to get back to you, and a description of the problem. And then Tim or one of the support guys will get an email saying, hey, we've got this new contact from KF5YY, and he called to ask some questions, and, and so we'll contact him again. Now, Jim, KF5YY, will get an email back from that system saying, thank you for entering the ticket, somebody will be with you momentarily. And when someone closes that ticket after they talk to each other, um, they'll get it. They'll both get a notification as well. So you can you can go through that system. You can send an email to support at hrdsoftwarellc.com. That email goes into the same system I was just talking about. That system will send you an email back saying we've got the same exact thing. We've got your information. Uh, we'll contact, somebody will contact you, and, uh, and I'll get back to why I do it that way, but the, all, the whole conversation happens within that system. Finally, you can call us. Uh, there's a toll-free number, which is 888-HRD-SOFT, um, or the uh, 813 number there that you can call. If, if we don't answer the phone, and we answer the phone almost all the time, but if we don't answer the phone, you can leave a voicemail. The voicemail gets converted into an email. The email goes into that system. And once we find out what your email address is, and we'll change that, then your, the system will send you an email saying we just got your notification, we'll contact you as soon as possible. All of those conversations go through that system so I can see that our support people are taking care of our customers well. And uh, their performance is extremely good. So I want to make sure that all of those, all those avenues that are available to you, whatever's the easiest way for you to do it, you can call us, someone will answer the phone. They all, have you ever heard of uh, Grasshopper? So there's a Grasshopper virtual phone system, that's what we use. Um, so if you call these numbers, it'll ring to one of these folks and they'll pick up the phone. If they're on the call, it'll go to voicemail and we'll get back to you. And this that's for uh, folks who are, who, are, who are currently within their software maintenance and support period. Otherwise, we've got free options. Um, you can go to our forums, a lot of people do forums.hamradiodeluxe.com. Um, this isn't what I would call one-to-one -one support, it's one-to-many support, or it's people helping each other. Uh, sometimes I'll go in there and I'll answer questions. What I like about that is, is that if somebody asks a question, I can answer that question, and not only am I answering it for one person, but I'm answering it for many people, and other people can see, because people all, I have found, they, they all have similar questions, so it helps to, it helps to do that. Facebook and Twitter, uh, we, we do take some questions on Facebook. Uh, a year or so ago, we weren't very good at that. Recently, I've started to do more and more of that. I wouldn't call it the best way to get a hold of us, but if, you, if you're a Facebook person, um, we've certainly got, we've got about 10,000 followers on Facebook. Uh, we interact with them. Um, I always post it if I send out a new newsletter, which by the way, how many people are receiving my newsletters? Uh, I got about 50% on that, so I'll get back to that in a moment. But I always put a notice out there saying we've released a newsletter, and the newsletter is also put uh, on our website under the blog. So this is probably, and I'll start, 
But what I want to make sure that out of the support process is clear is that if you call us or contact us through one of those methods, there are three and only three possible outcomes of that particular uh, contact. One is, is that Tim Ferry or Kevin will be able to solve that, that problem for you when, when you guys are on the phone, when, you guys, uh, when they take your call, and that'll be the end of it. Your problem is solved. Second one is, is that if they can't solve the problem, then it's probably a defect in the software. They're not developers, so they'll gather up all the information and record it in another system that the developers work from. They'll cre that, that system creates a reference number or a, a tracking number. They'll close your support ticket because they're not developers, and they'll give you the tracking number for that defect. And when we do our release notes, you'll see the tracking number there, and you'll know that, that that's when your particular item was resolved. The third possible thing is, is that you could be calling to say, we'd like to have an enhancement. We want this to be green or red, or we want to be able to do, you know, and, you know if I've got, we just recently added access to Club Log, or about a year ago, but there could be some new Club Log feature that folks want, and we'd like to have that added. Same thing's true. They're, they're not developers, they'll gather up the information, they'll create uh, uh, something in the developer system for tracking it, they'll give you the tracking number, close the ticket, the, the closure to that whole process is when we release the, the release notes, all the numbers are in there, and I'll show those to you in a moment. The developers, on the other hand, work based on priorities that are set by a combination or a conversation that happens around um, me and Randy, the owners. So I'll stand in front of you guys today or in the booth, and you'll tell me, you know, I wish you would look at this, or I wish you would look at that, or I entered this... Um, bug report a year ago, and I'm, I want to know what the status of this is, but I gather your feedback. We gathered the support team gathers feedback from our customers, and, and, and we're also looking forward in, in the industry to see what other people are doing or what we should do. And so we prioritize all that work, and we, we, we bring uh, things forward to the developers on a prioritized basis based on all that information. So a while back, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. I told this story the other day in in, uh, in Oregon, and then they thought it was funny. So I, I'll tell you here. I used to be a nightclub disc jockey, and uh, and so people would, you know, I would put up, you know, people somebody come up and they'd say, "Hey, I want you to play Leonard Scanner. Can you play Free Bird." And if you're a disc jockey, the last week there's a good and bad about playing Free Bird. How many people have heard? Right, everybody's heard Free Bird. It's eight and a half minutes long or something, right? 10, 12, I don't know what it is. But if you play it, you got time to go to the bathroom, and you got time to get a drink, and you come back, and it's still playing. So that's good. It's not like two minutes and 50 seconds song. The bad part about it is no one's going to dance to it ever. And somebody's going to come up and say, hey, why are you playing Freebird? We want to dance. Put on some Michael Jackson. So I put on some Michael Jackson, and somebody says, I hate that Michael Jackson stuff. Play some Led Zeppelin. And so, you, you know, you, the point I guess I'm trying to make is you can't make everybody happy, and I realize that. So when we were introducing new features, people would say, you know, I don't care about any of these new features, but I wish you'd fix this stuff that we called you about, you know, a year ago or two years ago. So then we went to fix it mode, and people said, I don't care about any of that stuff. I want you to introduce some new features. So what I ended up doing was I said, okay, we all need balance in life, right? <laughs> So we're going to put an 80-20 balance to this, and 80% of the content is going to be bug fixers or defect corrections, and 20% will be minor releases. I'll get to the major releases or, or enhancements. I'll get to the major enhancements in a moment. But have some balance between the enhancements um, and, the, uh, and, the, and the defect corrections or bug fixes. So through 2017, we pretty much held to that. Um, we made 150 changes, about 80% of those were uh, bug fixes, um, and we had some fairly significant bugs to fix. We don't anymore. We've still got some quirky things, and we're working through them. I'll get to that in a moment, but um, you know, a lot of it was, was maintenance. We've, we've slimmed up the code. The code was, you know, I, I'm going to make something up, but the code was 5 million lines. It's now 4 million lines. Um, the code's faster. Um, and so that, that was important too. Uh, this year, uh, so far, we've done uh, 
I think we're up to four releases, and this this number of changes is up about um, about a hundred now, or closing in on a hundred. So the question is, why would we do so many releases a year? And so it gets back to the Led Zeppelin and Michael Jackson thing to a degree, because. Um, We've got a backlog of things that people requested, even back before I even owned the software, uh, that people had asked Simon to do. And I've still got all that content. Much of it we've done, not all of it we've done. Some of it we've decided is no longer relevant because nobody's asking for it anymore. Um, but one of the things that, that, as it turns out, if we don't do releases fairly often, people will say, is it dead? Did you all quit? Did you take our money and go home? Are you ever going to address these things that we asked you for? And there's enough content out there that we actually, in order to get it done, we actually have to do more frequent releases. Um, so when you become a customer, to the extent that we can, we want, you to, we want to deliver bug fixes to you forever. So you should always be installing the latest version. The latest version is more stable than any of the other previous versions. And the bug fixes are things that you get, even if we don't unlock the new features for you because you have a renewed software maintenance and support. So to make sure that I say that again, to make sure it's clear. Bug fixes we're gonna do, to the extent that it's technically feasible, we're gonna provide those for free forever, <coughs> as long as it's feasible to do that. In order for you to get the fixes, you download the latest version of software and you install it. Sometimes we give away features. I think our, our licensing server will only allow us to lock 24 or 30 features. So if we have five new features that we want to put out this coming six months, we'll have to unlock five that we did in the past. So the features will either be non-existent, you won't see them, or they'll be grayed out when you try to use them and you'll call and say, hey, I want to upload to Club Log. Well, you have to renew software maintenance and support, or maybe in a year or so we'll be you know, through another 30 changes and we'll give it away. That's kind of how it works. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, folks also, last, so last year, I've worked in retail the majority of my life and a period of time I, I taught um, master's degree courses and various different things, but what I've learned in retail is that by the time you get to about Halloween, you don't change anything because yeah. You're going to break something because uh, Harper's first law of production operations is systems in production tend to stay in production until someone changes something. <laughs> systems don't break themselves, people break them. That's the way it happens. That's right. um, so um, I, I grew up in retail and I know for the most or at least half my career, so I don't make changes between Halloween and New Year's Day. So last year, we've been doing releases, we had nine releases. Uh, through you know the end of uh, October, and then we did nothing between October and January. And people are saying, "What are you doing? We went, we went one more. What, did you go out of business? Did you take our money and go home?" So anyway, I just want to make sure everybody understands that um, you won't see any releases from us between Halloween and New Year's Day. It's not going to happen. Unless, unless there was something really bad and wrong going on, if Microsoft could, and they've done this with the last two Windows 10 updates, by the way. But they could, Microsoft could make a change that would cause us to need to make a change. That could happen, but that's the only reason why we do that. And normally they don't make those kinds of changes during that period of time either. So that is kind of the philosophy there. The release notes, as I said, are available there. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do was, um, because there's a, there's a fairly good body of work that we need to get through. And uh, which is part of the reason why we're doing nine releases a year. It's, it's the only way that we can get through the backlog. And my intention was to get through the entire backlog this year. <clears throat> so I did something I'm calling a troop search. We went from one and a half developers to five developers this year. And I basically assigned each one of them to one to rig control, one to logbook, one to DM780, one to rotor control, and one to satellite tracking. And uh, because what, what my customers were telling me was, you're focusing too much time on logbook. I need you to focus on satellite tracking because it doesn't work right, or, or whatever. So I want each of them to be able to make pace, uh, make progress independently of the others. And so we've been able to do that. 
Um, and again, the 80 80 20 approach and, and nine releases a year, that's our goal. And we're going to continue that approach um, until we get the product or the backlog of defects and, and enhancements done. Make no mistake, I, I would say if I went back two years ago, I knew lots of customers who since then have told me, you know, two years ago, it would crash on me, logbook would shut down randomly, certain weird things were happening. If you load our latest version, I don't know anybody who's saying that. It's slimmer, it's faster. Um, I don't know of any crash scenarios, but if there were, we've implemented something in the software to gather back the information from those crashes. And the last time it happened, and it's been months and months, but the last time it happened, our developer got that uh, dump file, and within two hours, he knew what the problem was and he fixed it. Uh, versus in the past, we, didn't, we weren't collecting that kind of information. So it was a complete guess when, when a developer went in to try to, to make those changes. Um, you know, and I call it technical debt. We've got to get rid of all the stuff that's been piling up, and probably by the end of the year, we should be largely complete. Uh, we've added the new radios like the 7610. Um, we've made sure that the API that allows other programs like WSJTX and JT Alert or N1MM, we've made sure that those APIs can work well. Um, so today, or, you know, when I was in uh, CPAC last week, I had people come up and say, man, that was great. I, I really appreciate you getting that thing worked out with JT Alert and WSJT because they come directly in. I used to have to export and import and all this other kind of stuff, but now it just goes right in. I don't have any of that work to do. I, you know, They can manage all of their uh, award tracking and upload to Logbook of the World all within Logbook and it works out well. So there's some things that we want to do. Um, and at the top of my list, I may not write these and or read these in the same order, but the, at the top of my list is I want to have a complete remote access solution. Today what we have is, is a, rig, a remote access or a remote control of a radio, and then if you want an audio path, most, most people are installing Skype on both ends, so they can access you know, the microphone on the other end. Or they're using, uh, is anyone familiar with the remote rig hardware? So you know the remote rig hardware, if you use that, it's a $500 piece of equipment, the $500 here, $500 there on both ends. We're going to do all of that in software, and we're not going to increase the price of our software. So you'll be able to install. You will need a PC on both ends, but you install it, and um, you know wherever you go, you'll have access to the radio, you'll have access to the logbook, you'll have access to the audio path for either uh, voice or uh, digital modes. You'll have a CW key so you can send code back and forth. If you want to type it by hand, you can do that. Um, Access to your logbook, access to everything that you would need. That's that's our intention. And part of the reason for that is that there's so many HOA types of concerns, and people are starting to use shared club stations. So I've got customers. I'll get your question in just a second. I've got customers who have um, a club station. They've got you know four or five different stations in their club. They're all networked back to a single log, which we support. So um, and people can operate them remotely and they get there with our software, but we're going to make it better. I want to ask about you know, this API working with other applications. A while back when I tried to use the SGT, GT Alert, the DM780 from they, they didn't like it. I know it's a current version, I don't seem to see that, but I don't understand the N1 and the MN connections. Um, so, so let me repeat the question for folks in the back might have heard. So he said, uh, he was asking a question about the API, and some time back, there was a time where you couldn't have DM780 running if you had WSJT or JT Alert running. Um, there, and, and also that, um, uh, what's, what's the point in, in, in N1MM connecting to logbook? So I, answer, I think I answered the piece about the WSJT and so on. I think there was some defect that, that caused one of them to shut down when you had the other one running, but that doesn't happen anymore. But um, contesters, and there's probably plenty of them in the room, I'm more of a casual contester, but if I'm using um, N1MM 
or N3FJP or one of the contest programs, uh, when I'm done, I, I eventually have to export, if I want those QSOs in my logbook, I eventually have to export them all. And then once I export them all, I gotta import them all into my log, because that's where I'm gonna upload them to Logbook of the World or whatever, and track my awards and all that kind of stuff. That manual process is, for me, it's a pain. I don't have time for that. So um, what this does is it gives you the ability to make the QSOs in N1MM or N3FJP or whatever you're using, and they automatically populate into Logbook. So you don't have to export and import. Um, so you know that, that was broken here you know, probably, we fixed it um, probably about a year ago, right at about a year ago, because there were pieces of that that didn't work. Is that explained how to do that? Yes, absolutely. The question was, uh, in our wiki, does it show how to set that up? And it does in the wiki. Yeah. You kind of mentioned remote controls, like other than an apartment, can't put up anything. Can you put up a 440 antenna? And my, so I have my I kind of set 300 down at my dad's house, which is, you know, an hour and a half away. Mm -hmm. So I can set up a PC in my dad's house controlling my ICOM 7300, and have my laptop at home, both running the software, and then control my radio <coughs> my dad's house. Right? That's right. You can do that today. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, you well, can do I don't that need now. to buy ICOMs the RS and the <coughs> software. What's that? I don't need to buy ICOMs expensive software. No. Excellent. Thank you. So let me repeat the question for folks who might didn't hear that one. Uh, the question was, was that, um, you know, I, I live in an apartment and uh, uh, I can't even put up a 440 mag mount, uh, you know, out of the apartment basically. And uh, so he connects to his dad's or to a station at his dad's house. It's a few hours away. And um, you know what, what? What would he need in order to do that? And so you can do that with our software today. You put a computer next to the radio, and um, our our software is connected to the radio and it's all running. So then back at the <coughs> apartment, you would be running our software there as well, and you connect over the internet to the radio, and you can completely remote control the radio remotely. It's flawless. If you, When you want the audio path for voice or data, you have to use Skype. And there's a couple other things that people are using. But if you use Skype, you set it for auto answer. So basically, you go into Skype, you select the my station, whatever connection, and it automatically answers. And now you hear your radio on your on your remote computer. Yes. And it has the ability to turn the radio on and off and on. If your radio supports it, yeah. Okay. So the question was, do I have the ability to turn the radio on and off? The answer is yes. Qualified, yes, because here's the thing. I've got an FTDX 5000. And the 5000 has the power button that I can get to remotely. However, once you, some radios, when you power it down, the cap port is no longer lit. So um, what, what I use on mine just for that reason is I have an external, um, an external, uh, uh, Rig interface. I, I use a micro gear too for that, and um, that keeps that CAD interface hot all the time, so I can turn it on and off. But if you're just using, you know, a serial port or something, once that thing's shut down, it's not powered, and you can't, you can't, it, it won't, it will ignore the command because it's not running. Does that make sense? Yes. So it, it just kind of depends on what radio you use. Is there other programs you use besides Skype for the voice? Yeah, and if you come by the booth and talk to Tim, he's He's got another one I can, you know, can I use something besides Skype for the audio path? There's another software out there that a lot of guys are using. Anybody? Huh? Bumble. Bumble. Bumble? Yeah. It's another popular software. Yeah. But basically what you need is something that can set up a, a voice over IP connection between both of the stations. We're going to put that in the software, but you would use something like that. If you come by the booth, Tim's got a couple of other things that he knows of people using. Question. Uh huh? You say long term on Linux. Any idea how long long term is? It's going to be two years. And the question was when are you going to have a Linux version? It's probably two years out. Um, there's a number of things that we have to resolve before we can do that because the uh, 
course, the software is developed in Microsoft Visual Studio, so it's highly Microsoft-centric right now. Uh, so we've got a roadmap for getting there. It's just going to take us a while because we've got to work around some other Microsoft-specific um, com calls and so on. Question. Uh -huh. are, uh, going with Microsoft, are there issues with versions of Microsoft? The question is, are there issues with different versions of Windows? And the answer is we support everything from Windows 7 forward. Because we develop in Microsoft Visual Studio, it's C++ and MSC for nerdy people that care. Um, we have to carry forward the current, ver the most supported version of Virtual Stu Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we move forward in Visual Studio, Microsoft will abandon operating systems that they no longer support. So Vista just ended, Microsoft ended, uh, XP ended a while back. But we're good with Windows 7 and forward until they decide that they're not doing Windows 7 anymore. But there, there are no, uh, with Windows 7, Windows 8, and Windows 10, <clears throat> there are no issues. They all work the same. They all work the same. So on your, uh, your debug capability built within these RDs, I noticed that it's kind of real time. So if something's not working, then I don't understand. I don't get a historical view. So I only get a view of what's going on while that logging window is up. Will you kind of change that at all? Um, so the question is, the, deb the debugging that we've introduced recently allows us to, to capture the details about a particular event, but doesn't show the history of events in that debug. And the reason for that is we, we started taking the, the approach of gathering more information and going back further. The files became extremely large. And so, um, and, and we really didn't gain a lot by collecting a lot of that additional history and information. It, it was for me from calling you. What's that? I mean, I'm sure. Yeah. Because it keeps me from calling you. Yeah. So yeah. Plus, but, okay. But that, that's why we did that, just to keep the file small, because uh, we allow all of our customers to submit those dump files if they get one. If you know about them, you can look at them or you can read through them. Uh, when our developer gets it, it's smaller. We really wanted to do the larger one, and we did for a while, but it just became too unwieldy to, to try to manage. We're probably going to automate this, by the way. Um, you know, if, if there's a crash scenario that happens and the dump file gets created, rather than asking you to submit it, we should, we'll collect it uh, directly. Um, and what what the system that we'll collect it in will be one that can do um, heuristics. Um, and tell us which ones are happening most often, if that were the case, so that that way we're putting our effort on the things that are happening more often than the things that aren't. Um, so I talked about remote access. Um, we've been asked to do different language versions. Um, there's a lot of Europeans using the software. We get requests for German a lot, um, French, Russian, um, Japanese would be a big opportunity for us because there's a lot of hams in Japan, but as I was looking at this recently, there's a web page where you can go and get uh, the number of hams by country. And if you collect up all that and kind of pivot this in a spreadsheet, you come to the conclusion that there, you know, among the hams in the United States plus other countries that speak English as a primary language, it's 90, 80, 90 percent of the total population of hams in the world. So we may not get a big upswing from doing a language update uh, by doing, doing one of those languages, um, but we'll see. I mean, we get a lot of requests for Russian, but there are like, uh, I looked at this, there are like 50,000 hams in Russian. And how many of those would actually buy the software if we did that? So that's kind of what's in that. Um, we're going to completely rewrite the rig control stuff because uh, when the 7610 came out, I got 10 minutes, so I'm going to bring it to a close pretty quickly and have more time for questions. When the 7610 came out, it took us far too long to add the 7610. And it has to do with how the, um, <coughs> the code is written and how hard coded the uh, commands are within the code. And so what we're going to do is separate the, the, the command files from the software. 
so that the and then it'll be in an XML format if you care. But I mean, there'll be a, a rig control file for every single rig. The commands will be readable. If we need to change them, we can change them. We don't have to recompile code. We don't have to have a developer go and do it. Um, there's a, a free software out there that just does uh, provides a rig control, virtual rig control port called OmniRig, and that's the model that they use. All those files are separate. I've actually written and contributed files to that for different radios that I've got. But we think if we do that, we'll be quicker to get rigs uh, to market, and people can, you can add things to it, you can tweak it, you can decide, well, I don't like how this, this command works, I want to change it, and you, can, you can have the ability to do that. So back in Linux, um, that's on, that's on the roadmap, like I said, but it's going to take us a little time to get there. Let me hit a couple other things real quickly. There are lots of different ways to connect with us. Um, if you don't get our newsletter, I'm going to probably do another one here next week. Send an email to newsletters at hrdsoftwarellc.com. Everybody's getting their cameras out, so I'll give you a little moment to take the picture. Um, send an email there, and I'll add you to the newsletter. Um, I get lots of compliments on the newsletter. Again, I'm a very guy, so I put a lot of stuff in there. And sometimes it's uh, information about Ham Radio Deluxe. Other times it's uh, an article that I wrote that's more general interest. Uh, anybody read the one that I sent out about DX clusters a while back? Okay, so you know those kinds of things are the things that you know we'll try to do in the newsletter. Um, the blog on our website. I repost the newsletters there, so if you didn't get the previous newsletters, if you go to this blog site, you can see the previous newsletters and other stories that get posted there. Our forums, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all, all that social media stuff. Um, you're welcome to interact with us there. Um, we're doing 24% um, off here at the show uh, for both new customers and renewals. Um, it's 20% off inclusive of tax, so the, the total discount is like 28% by the time we have to add local sales tax. Um, what would cost $100 online is 80 bucks here. The renewals would cost 50 bucks online. They're 40 bucks here. So, I'll try to get through as much as I could. We've got eight minutes. Um, should be some time for questions. Anybody? On the, uh download a new version, what's the proper procedure to really do that? Do you say, well, let's just make files off somewhere, you're logging up things, what is the best way to put in a new version? The, the question was, what's the best way to do the upgrade? How should, should I do the upgrade? Should I uninstall the previous versions and then install the new version? And in 95% 90, of all cases, if you just download it and install it right off our website, everything is perfect. You won't see any, any problems. None of your files, your, your layouts, because all we're doing is replacing the executables. We're not touching any of your logbook, we're not touching any of your configuration file, your layouts, none of that. So you don't need to do a backup. You shouldn't need to do a backup, but you should be backing up your log all the time anyway, right? Um, let me point that out real quick, because there are five different backups that you can create simultaneously in logbook, and they happen automatically. Don't, even though you think your desktop computer is the most secure place in the world, don't use it. There are five of them. Use all five. Put it on Dropbox, Box, OneDrive, iCloud, Google Drive. That's what I do. And all my logs are in the cloud. And if I can't get to a backup of my log, the world has bigger problems than my log. Just wait. This is scheduled to the end of 1150. Oh, is it? Yeah. One more question. You mentioned numerous changes. What prompts those changes? Customers. Customers prompt the changes. So if you tell us you want a new feature, or if you tell us you think something is broken, we go off and try to fix it. We try to give you the feature that you've asked for. That becomes a priority. Have you beat out so far? No. <laughs> there are a lot of it. There are a lot of you. There are more and more of you than there are of me. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate that. Come on, folks. <laughs>